All right, good evening, everyone. I see people steadily joining, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the webinar. My name is Allie Fisher, and I'm the MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife and Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Associate for Oregon Wild. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight for the sea otter reintroduction efforts on the Oregon coast, our 2022 update. I'm honored to introduce our guest tonight, Bob Bailey from the Alaka Alliance, which is a group of tribal nonprofit and conservation leaders dedicated to bringing sea otters back to the Oregon coast. I would also like to include a land acknowledgement in this space. I would like to offer gratitude to the land itself and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I would like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous peoples on the land today, as well as historical events, including colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have had long lasting and current impacts. In particular, I'd like to recognize the important relationship that coastal indigenous peoples have with the sea otter. These include, but are not limited to, tribes that now form from the Confederate tribes of the Sletz Indians, the Confederate tribes of Kuz, Lower Umqua, and Sayusla Indians, and the Coquel Indian tribe. However, it must be noted that this brief acknowledgement can in no way capture the vast complexity and nuance that surrounds the history of tribes, the history between them and the federal government and individual states. That being said, the most important thing to do is not only acknowledge indigenous peoples and the land today, but continue to do meaningful work by supporting them in the present, respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty, doing your research and taking action. A great way to do that today is to donate to the Alaka Alliance if you're able to help support their work. You can also learn about other ways to support them on their website, which is on this slide. And after the q and I'll also um, add the link into the chat. Additionally, half the proceeds from our raffle tonight will be donated to the Alaka Alliance. So that's another way you can lend your support. The raffle will be open after the presentation if you decide you want to enter. We have a lot of really great prizes tonight, such as our Oregon Wild T-shirt, um, the Oregon Ancient Forest Hiking Guide, and one of our business partners actually made a Tea of the Month inspired by sea otters and the recovery campaign. Um, so we have a $40 gift card available and a gift box that's associated with that. Lastly, a recording of this program will be emailed out tomorrow and will be posted on our website, organwild.org, in the Wild blog. Please enter your questions at any time, preferably in the Q&A instead of the chat feature. We usually get a flood of questions right at the end of the presentation, so the sooner you can get yours in, the easier it is for me to organize and answer them after our guest has finished presenting. Also, make sure to RSVP for our next webinar on February 9th at 6 p.m. You can find this online at OregonWild.org. Now I'll pass it off to Bob Bailey. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> that, that was fabulous. Shorter than I expected, too. So uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, attending tonight. I know it's a, a tough thing to sit down and listen to something about sea otters instead of having dinner or that after work uh, drinky poo that you, you wanted, but I appreciate your being here. I'm going to click over and share screen now. At least I'm going to try. Uh, there we go. Can you see that? No, no, you can't. Share. There we go. I think that's it. Yep, that looks good to me. Excellent. Thank you for the feedback. Okay, okay so my name is, in fact, Bob Bailey, Robert Bailey, uh, officially known, uh, Robert John Bailey, uh, technically. Um, and I am the board chairman of the Alaka Alliance. Just a brief background, I grew up on the Oregon coast in the Coos Bay area, uh, spent most of my career, 30 plus years working for the state of Oregon, doing coastal and ocean management. And I retired about 10 years ago and never in my life thought I would be working on sea otters and trying to bring them back to Oregon. Uh, it's a it's a calling that reached out and, and touched me, and here we are. 
so I'm, I'm honored to be working on it uh, uh, and with many of you that are uh, watching this. So I want to give a brief run through tonight about just a little bit. This is not going to be Sea Otter 101, uh, which has been uh, kind of our mode for the last couple of years of explaining what sea otters are, uh, why they're missing in Oregon, what their ecological role is, and all of that. Uh, I'm assuming you know that. And towards the end of the talk, I'm going to be referring to a whole bunch of information resources where you can go learn about all of that, but I'm not going to go through that tonight. This is going to be more of a, a status report, a little brief overview of who we are, why we're doing what we're doing, and then I'm going to get into what we're doing. And uh, even then, there's a lot going on. Uh, we're trying to build the airplane even as we fly it, and there's a lot of part moving parts. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of bounce my way through a number of issues and it may or may not touch on things you want to know. So if I'm missing things, uh, please put them in the chat and I'll try to pick up on that at the end of the discussion. There's many, many paths and many, many things I could talk about tonight, but I'm trying to simplify it and, and uh, make it uh, approachable so you can understand kind of where we are in our mission. So the Alaka Alliance was Really, it grew out of an informal organization that a man named David Hatch um, organized back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Dave was a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz and came to understand through his own personal journey that uh, sea otters were missing, uh, missing both culturally and ecologically. And he and I at that time talked a bit about bringing them back, but uh, I was not in a position to really do anything about it. I never really thought seriously about it. Dave continued to push ahead with his informal organization called the Alaka Alliance. And it wasn't until probably 2017, 2018, that uh, after David had passed away, that it fell to a number of us to pick up his flag and really take his effort and move it on to the next level and actually get the job done. Uh, so we formed an, an Oregon nonprofit in 2018 you know, did the standard adopt a strategic plan. Okay, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And uh, actually got our 501c3 in, in early 19, uh, 2020. So uh, as you can see, uh, tribal involvement from the very beginning has been crucial to the Ilaka Alliance, the, uh, particularly the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians through Dave, and through now, his son Peter is on our board, Robert Kenta, uh, Don Ivey, chief of the Coquel Indians, who recently passed away, uh, was instrumental in advising our efforts and serving on our board. And then more recently, Doc Slider, the chief of the uh, Confederated Tribes of Coos Lower Umpqua, Saisla Indians, joined the board and uh, has been a, a real contributor. So that's a real part of our legacy. So why are we doing this? And, and I'll just touch on this briefly, because it's a missing keystone species. Uh, when I started my career working coastal ocean issues, there, we really didn't know what a keystone species was. That was before that, that concept had really entered the ecological <clears throat> science literature. But we now understand that sea otters uh, affect the marine environment as more profoundly than any other animal especially in the nearshore environment. And they were once plentiful on the Oregon coast, but they've been absent, uh, except for the stray from, from Washington, for more than 100 years. And as marine science uh, developed in Oregon in the late 1800s, 1900s, uh, the consequences of their absence was neither really appreciated nor understood. It wasn't until recently that people have tumbled to the idea that, no, oh, a keystone species is missing. So, uh, and that's been highlighted a bit by the loss of kelp beds uh, up and down the coast, not everywhere, but many places, uh, and replaced with urchin barrens because there are no sea otters. And as I mentioned, Oregon's coastal tribes feel that loss uh, in, in terms of the cultural connection, the, the ancient almost family connection between uh, Indian people and sea otters. So we know that uh, from studies up and down the West Coast, uh, as it's well established that sea otters protect kelp forests 
increasing the diversity, productivity, and resilience of these nearshore ecosystems. Uh, this is just a cartoon drawing in many ways of the absolute amazing um, complexity of these areas. And on top of that, uh, kelp captures carbon. So simply put, visually put, uh, with sea otters, this is what you see. Without sea otters, this is what you see. These are urchin barrens, two of them uh, examples, one near Cape Lookout uh, from 2020, and one from off uh, the, in the cove there at Port Orford from 2018. A truly appalling and alarming development is the spread of these urchin barrens. And urchins just, they, they devour kelp. And without sea otters, this is what happens. So our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters to the Oregon coast, and in the process, make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. Yeah, we're, we're all about the cute sea otters, but really we're more about the ecosystem results that uh, sea otters provide. So our strategic object objectives are fairly common sense. They're things you might think of. The first one is to assess the scientific and economic feasibility of sea otter restoration. The second one is to help the region reach consensus on restoration. And by consensus, we don't mean unanimity. We mean a preponderance of uh, agreement. And then, if warranted, we would proceed with restoration in carefully chosen places. So let's take a look at that, uh, how we are playing this out. So, we're trying to go from the idea of our mission statement to actually putting animals in the water. And that's a long journey. It's like looking into the distance and seeing some mountaintops way out there. And you think, well, we'll get there by mid afternoon. And by evening, you're still driving and the mountains are still out there. So we, we need to get from mission statement to animals in the water. So what we've proceeded to do is to get the science right and to work towards achieving consensus. And then at some point here down the line, we'll make a decision about proceeding. But I'm here to report tonight that one of the key things that we've done is to begin to put tangible results to getting the science right. And we recently uh, completed a feasibility study that will help us move down the line towards this decision. And I wanna spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about this feasibility study because it's a foundational document that will lead to all sorts of additional work that is going to need to be done before we can actually get animals in the water. Here's a schematic timeline of kind of where we are. This little uh, red badge up here in the upper left is where we are at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. Uh, and this is just a totally made up schematic. Uh, who knows how accurate any of this is going to be, but you know, we're looking at a con con always doing our public and stakeholder outreach and engagement. That's an ongoing mission. Our feasibility study is wrapped up. Uh, we're looking at possibly doing some translocation planning, actually the logistics of what that would, would take. That's going to be at least another year, year and a half of work. It may involve an application to the US Fish and Wildlife Service down the line uh, and the Marine Mammal per, uh, Commission for permits to actually move, capture and move animals. That would trigger a NEPA analysis, the environmental impact assessment or, or the e, a full blown EIS, depending on where the animals come from. Eventually then that would feed into a, a US Fish and Wildlife Service and their decision-making uh, as to uh, what to do with our application for a permit. And then if all goes forward, then we would actually do some uh, serious uh, operational and translocation planning and implementation. Realistically, I don't see this happening with any shorter than five or six years. Who knows? It might. It might be faster than that. It may be 10 years, but I think uh, five or six years is probably a reasonable expect expectation for us to uh, have a translocation operation underway. In the meantime, we continue to try to build our capacity as an organization. We started with nothing. Uh, we've um, recently, although we've been had people on contract, we recently hired 
uh, Chanel Hassan as our first employee. She's our communications outreach uh, community engagement person. She had been on contract, but now she's an employee and we're hoping to continue to build out. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So let's, let's zero in on this feasibility study because this is the foundational document really for everything we're gonna do from here on out. Uh, it, we scoped it out at a big sea otter workshop in Seattle in 2019. Uh, we looked around for people that could pull this together. Uh, we ended up with a great team I'll show you in a minute. The draft was published back in the end of August, put on our website. We left that open for three months for public comment. And then uh, those comments were received. We sent them back to the uh, study team and the final document was published on our website at the end of January, uh, just a week or so ago. So you can go to our website, either www.alakaalliance.org or you can just Google Alaka Alliance. And the minute you Google Alaka, it'll come up to us. So you can go to that and, and read our, our feasibility study. The goal of it was uh, to assist us in identifying and our partners, stakeholders, et cetera, in identifying, understanding, and addressing all the factors relevant to restoring the population of sea otters on the Oregon coast. It's not a decision document. It's not an EIS. It's not as thorough as some people would like. But what it wanted, we wanted it to do is to scope out all of those issues we're going to have to address in, uh, down the line and give us a, a basis for understanding whether this was even a feasible idea in this uh, world today. The authors really uh, are like the A-team of uh, sea otter scientists uh, around the world. I felt uh, when uh, Tim Tinker here on the lower right, who is the, the, the uh, leading author, the, the principal author of this, the report, when he and Jim Estes and these others signed on, I thought, you know, I felt like I was managing a, a baseball team and I just acquired the best shortstop pitcher, catcher, et cetera, for, for my team. And uh, I, I couldn't be happier with these folks. They've turned out to be not only top-notch contributors uh, from a scientific sense, but really good friends and supporters of our effort. And it's been great to have them. So this is Tim Tinker's diagram, uh, a feasibility study, what goes into it. And as you can see here, it's kind of a sausage maker uh, where a lot of things go into it. You turn the crank and you uh, come out the other side um, with some understanding of whether this is feasible or not. And in what ways are you going to have to really adjust yourself to uh, make that happen? So the study itself, and this is these are really little screenshots of when you go to the feasibility study, on our website, you, you can download it and read both a summary of each chapter, which is kind of a, the shorthand version. And if you want more, you can download the whole darn chapter. But it's there's introduction, the history of other translocations, which is a big, big question we get, has this been done before, including the one in Oregon in the 19, early 1970s. Uh, a whole chapter on populations demographics, how, basically how sea otters work. Uh, how do they grow? How do they, um, how do they spread their, uh, throughout their range? Genetics, uh, Sean Larson up in Seattle at the Seattle Aquarium um, and others contributed to this. That's a big question for us is the genetic makeup and the genetic benefits to bringing sea otters back to Oregon. The ecosystem effects of otters, uh, a look at the habitat suitability on the Oregon coast, economic considerations we'll have to, to uh, deal with legal considerations, the, the regulatory framework, the procedural environment that we'll need to be working. That's all laid out uh, with assistance from uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service who helped to review that section. Just kind of what implementation and logistics, what would it take to mount uh, a translocation operation? What kind of logistics would we need to, to think about? There's a great chapter on animal health and welfare written by Dr. Mike Murray, Dr. Mike from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, who really weighed into this thing and gave us a chapter and verse on the things we're going to need to consider. Uh, a chapter on stakeholder concerns and perspectives. And as somebody who worked for the last 30 years on coastal and ocean issues in Oregon, this really came as no surprise to me, but it's, 
it's nice to see these things written down. And then there are some overall conclusions. And those are reintroductions are in fact a successful conservation tool, not only in the world of sea otters, but with many other species, the marten, wolves, um, wolverines, and, and many, many species. So reintroductions are a tool that are widely recognized and can be successful. And further, and the better news is that reintroducing sea otters to Oregon is in fact likely to see, succeed, as it says here, with appropriate considerations, meaning we have to do our homework and that's what we intend to do. Uh, surprisingly, estuaries may be an important part of the reintroduction environment. That's something uh, I don't think any of us really considered going into this, although the news out of California with Elkhorn Slough and the success of uh, sea otter population growth in Elkhorn Slough has really, I think, helped to ignite this conversation about the role of estuaries as a habitat uh, to be occupied by sea otters. And clearly the return of sea otters will have many direct and indirect effects, both in the ecosystem and on the uh, um, communities uh, nearby where they will uh, be located. And that means that we need to account for the socioeconomic factors and regulatory issues that will surround this introduction. So bottom line, no showstoppers. And uh, well, I wasn't really expecting any, it was nice to see um, that that's what the, the study concluded. Uh, but for more detail, burrow into the, the chapters in the feasibility study, because there is a ton of really good information. So one of the parts of the, the study that is just astounding to me personally, and I think was astounding to the study team, is a population, sea otter population model that Tim Tinker developed. He's developed this slowly over the years as he's worked on the ecology of sea otters in a variety of locations, Southeast Alaska, uh, British Columbia, Haida Gwaii, Central California, San Nicolas Island, Channel Islands in California. And over time, he's developed this, this population model that as you can see from the little graphic there in the upper left, there's real math behind this thing. And if uh, you, like me, uh, decided that math was not my top subject when I was in college, you might think your eyes will glass over, but that's all behind the screen. And Tim has really made this amazing population model. And I wanna show a little bit of it to you because this is going to be so helpful to us. And I think to the public out there in under, making some decisions about sea otters and where they uh, are the most beneficial places we could put them and in what numbers and so on. So this population model, uh, it, it, its purpose is to predict the population density after X years, and you specify that, and or the years uh, out to carrying capacity. You want to know how, how many uh, popular, how many sea otters there will be after a certain number of years, or how long would it take to get to carrying capacity? Behind the screen is a whole lot of data, or a whole lot of data from previous translocations and reoccupation uh, varies by sea otters. Uh, the, it's informed by the life history characteristics of sea otters, which is to say, females have one pup a year, they don't have a litter. Uh, which is to say that, that uh, females don't move around. At most, they might move a mile or two in either direction. Uh, Tim has done a lot of work studying how sea otters occupy various spaces over time. And so the, all of that science goes behind the screen. And then there's the physical and biological conditions, kind of the GIS layers uh, for each of 41 segments along the Oregon near shore and in estuaries. And I'll show you that in a second. Then you as the user get to go in and put in uh, some inputs, which is to say, all right, how many animals do you want to uh, introduce? Uh, what's the ratio of male to female? What's the age distribution? Is this a single uh, introduction or will there be supplemental introductions? And a host of other uh, user inputs 
uh, that you can uh, play with. And then you run the model over an air, a length of time that you specify and you see what comes out the other end. So here's what it looks like. So this is a page from, if you go to the sea otter population model and you can get to this online and you too can operate this thing, you'll see here on the right is a, a series of three maps. You know, the Oregon coast is very long and linear. So this is kind of chopped up into three segments, but you'll see that that each of the regions of the coast, south, central, and north, are divided into smaller segments. And each of those segments is then its own modeling uh, context. So for instance, S6 is there at, at uh, Cape Blanco with the little orangey area off the, the tip uh, that is Orford Reef right in here uh, near, near Port Orford. Uh, and at the other end here's uh, at the upper end mouth of the Columbia River is a section or cell N9. So over on the left, you, this is just a, a little bit of the, you can go on to, and when you go to this site, you can work these various sliders that have the number of otters initially added. You can specify the, the sections that you're going to put them in, the number of otters, uh, the number of times you want to run the model, et cetera, et cetera. So it's pretty astounding. So this is an idea of what you get uh, out the other end. And this is just a, a hypothetical situation that if, on the lower left here, if X animals, in this case, about 40 animals are introduced at a certain point uh, at time zero, the population always, based on experience, always drops, it always dwindles and goes to some low point before it rebounds over 10 years, 20 years, now into the future. What you see with the darker line in the middle is the model's estimate with a 95% confidence interval that that's what's gonna happen. The gray area is really as the projections uncertainty. The, the model could be right all the way to here, or it could be right all the way to here. But the confidence interval is this gray bar, which is what we pay attention. The other thing is it shows that for instance, in this case, if a certain number of animals were uh, released in that Port Orford, Cape Blanco area, there would be a certain number of animals spread north, certain number of animals spread south after the, the uh, time interval you you specified. So you can see both uh, in graphic form, the number of animals that might be available, and then also a map of predicted distribution. The other thing that uh, we're able to do with that is to turn around and run the same scenario. In this case, 100 animals, which would be 70 initial introduction followed by three per year over 10 years. What would happen at each of the, in each of these cells, which gives you an idea of which are the better or more suitable habitat areas. And as might be expected, the Rogue Reef, Redfish Rock, Port Orford, Cape Blanco, Cape Arago, and surprisingly, Tillamook Bay, showed up as some of the better areas for um, sea otter survival. Uh, and Tillamook Bay primarily because of the huge shellfish resource within the bay. One of the other things that we did with this was to uh, develop four what if scenarios. We selected these uh, two cells, the Crook Point, Rogue Reef, Redfish Rocks, Cape Blanco, Cape Arago, Coos Bay, and then the Seal Rocks to Depot Bay area and ran a bunch of uh, what if scenarios about what would happen if we introduced 200 sea otters in these areas, what would be their uh, population growth over uh, 25 years. So what we said was, all right, let's, let's say if we wanna have a target of 200 animals in these areas in 25 years, what would it take to achieve that? How many animals would we have to introduce to achieve that? As you can see, if here uh, way over on the right at, at time at uh, 2050, 25 years out or so, if you want to achieve 20 animals, or 200 animals in these four areas, you have to start with actually different numbers of animals depending on the site. 
Yaquina Bay, Otter Rock, the Depot Bay area, you're going to need more animals. You're going to need 370 or so animals to introduce in 2025 if you want to get to 200 animals in 2050 versus, say, Port Orford, Cape Blanco, which is appears to be better habitat. You'd only need 250 animals to get to 200 animals out there. This downward slope is a feature of many translocations of many species of animals, but it's particularly measured in sea otters. And that's because a lot of them just leave town immediately after translocation. And it takes a while for the population to stabilize and recover. And once it starts recovering, then you see this upward growth, uh, the upward slope until uh, the population uh, really takes off. So, but it takes a long time. Uh, and you, if you know the history of Cal uh, in California of sea otters there, you know, they were discovered, a remnant population was discovered or seen in, at, uh, in, on the Big Sur area in the 1930s, a population of probably 50 animals. And it took, you know, 40 years before they really spread widely up and down the coast. So it, it'll, it will take a while. There's not going to be sea otters everywhere, thousands of them up and down the coast. They're going to be pretty localized for quite a while. So the other thing that uh, that model allows us to do is to look to see whether or not we're, uh, introducing them at one site or at multiple sites uh, is uh, uh, beneficial. And so what we see on the, the lower left, and I added these little orange football shaped things. If you, if you put in 100 sea otters at one site, and this is just, uh, this is for section S6, or 25 years, you're gonna end up with 69 sea otters, but the curve will be upward. Whereas if you have two uh, reintroduction sites, in this case, S, uh, what is it? Uh, it would be Coos Bay and uh, Cape Arago, supplemented by three adults for a year. Uh, you can start with 70 and end up with 126. So multiple releases, uh, and do a better job than a single release. And so that's something we're going to need to consider. The other interesting thing that this uh, model did was to allow us to look backwards at the uh, 1970-71 reintroduction of sea otters on the Southern Oregon coast, which ultimately failed. And there's been a lot of talk about why that happened. Um, and we can go into that if you want. But what this did was to match the uh, model's projections for the number of animals that would have been introduced. And there was 93 of them that were introduced uh, in 1970, 71. That immediately, the model shows, would have dropped low, 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 low before it started to increase. And the range of probability actually goes below zero. And you can see that that matches up with the survey counts from 72 to 81. Those, in fact, did drop low, 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 and in fact, winked out, which kind of confirms the thinking that there simply were not enough animals either uh, introduced to begin with, and none were followed up. So um, that may be a part of the answer to what happened to the sea otters around the Port Orford, Cape Arago area. Yeah, 50 years ago. So because uh, we think that the South Coast is probably going to be the region most likely to, to see in an introduction, uh, beginning April 1, we're going to be hiring, or we have hired, and he will begin his work, uh, a South Coast community liaison. Uh, and his job will be to work between Coos Bay and Brookings on behalf of the uh, Alaka Alliance to both talk about sea otters, their values, their benefits, uh, as well as to listen to community concerns, work with stakeholders, and be involved at that local level in trying to integrate our project, our interest with uh, the communities there. Uh, I would just offer up that that person is going to be a man named Frank Burris. Uh, Frank has spent the last 20 years being the Extension Sea Grant agent in Curry County, 
Uh, he's retiring uh, at the end of March, and we're thrilled to have him on board. I can't think of a better person to, who knows the community, who knows the stakeholders, and they know him. And I can't think of a better person to represent our interests on the South Coast. So uh, we're thrilled to have Frank on board beginning April 1. Now, that's not to say that we've decided on um, specific release sites, and that doesn't preclude maybe some releases to, to the north up the, up the coast. Uh, but this is the area that's certainly going to probably be the most, uh, the most likely where those translocations will take place. We've also got a, uh, an economic impact assessment um, underway. It's probably not going to be as deep a dive as some people would like, but it's uh, to assess the economic impacts on fisheries, coastal tourism and outdoor recreation, we're going to try to take a look at the carbon sequestration value, although that's, that's turning out to be a very difficult topic to really address in anything more than an arm waving level. And then to put, try to put some context around non-use values, the ecological values that might be enhanced or enabled by sea otters. Uh, and uh, we've asked them to take a look at the four what if scenarios, because as it turns out, Economists typically use data that already exists. And in our case, we're asking them to try to assess a situation that has not yet existed and for which there are no data, which is one of the reasons why we did these what if scenarios. What if there were 200 sea otters at Port Orford? What if there were 200 sea otters uh, in the Coos Bay, Cape Arago region, et cetera? We've been uh, under, undertaking some discussions with a variety of people around the concept of blue carbon and sea otters. Uh, as you've seen, there's, this is a, a pretty hot topic in, in, in the media. Uh, there's been a lot of articles produced about sea otters as climate warriors, and we believe they are, uh, but we'd like to go further than that and actually see if we can't uh, quantify what that might be um, in terms of carbon value and relating carbon sequestration to sea otters. But we're, we're convinced that this is a topic that's ripe. After all, there's been research on elephants and how they affect a carbon storage in some of the forests in Africa or whales and how they affect carbon storage in the marine environment. So we think sea otters are, are a ripe candidate for this. And as my son says, come for the cute, stay for the carbon. Okay, emerging out of the the world of the economics and feasibility study. Um, we're also continuing to pursue this idea of achieving consensus. And, you know, when we started this thing, there was who knew what COVID was. Uh, so I had several of us driving up and down the coast, meeting with people and talking one on one and uh, making presentations. But when COVID hit, it, of course, totally changed the game. As for, and I'm sure for Oregon Wild has changed the game and for many of you watching, it's changed your life too, in terms of using the internet, social media, webinars and others to um, do your work and get your message across. And that's our case too. And actually in, in, in an odd way, it's been beneficial. It's allowed us to do more and uh, with, a, with a bigger reach. So we've got a great website. Uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, except to say that if you're interested in sea otters, our, we strive to make that the best sea otter website in the world, where you can go and find a ton of information, all the way from general um, articles to uh, scientific papers. Chanel uh, has done a great job of energizing our Facebook site, our uh, Twitter account, Instagram, and maintaining our YouTube channel. And I wanna to touch base on that for just a second because if you, like me, are a visual learner, there are, I think now, 46 videos on our YouTube channel that are, if you wanna learn about sea otters or marine ecology or kelp forest and related issues, you are in hog heaven here. Uh, we've got not only webinars that we've hosted, but we've got, uh, videos from all the presentations of our 
a three-day sea otter science symposium from this year. Our sea otter, uh, I guess I can't scroll up, but our sea otter science symposium from last year, which was online, and then our sea otter science symposium from 2019 that was live, but we videotaped all those sessions. And there are, it's a, a sort of a who's who of a marine scientists who study these things giving these presentations. So um, get on the exercise bike and flip on a YouTube of uh, around sea otter science and uh, have a good time. So the other thing we've been doing and Chanel's been really working hard on this too, is building partnerships with a whole range of individuals, institutions, organizations, businesses, agencies. And this, these, I love to put the logos up here just because it helps me see all of the outreach we've been doing and, and the connections that we're making. Some of these folks are funders, some of these folks are supporters, some of these folks are participants, but it's uh, true to the word alliance. We are the Alaka Alliance, and which means all of us, it means our allies too. And so, uh, you know, we're not gonna be able to do this job alone. It's going to take all of us and, and uh, we're really happy to be making these partnerships. And frankly, it's fun. Uh, it's really fun to engage people in this idea. One of the most productive and meaningful partnerships we've got is with the Oregon Zoo. And uh, this last year, they produced, the zoo staff produced two really good videos that I commend to you. Both are short. They won't take a lot of time. Uh, the first is a wonderful, wonderful video on the cultural significance of Oregon sea otters. Uh, featuring Peter Hatch, who's on our board of directors, and whose father, David Hatch, was really the founder of the Alaka Alliance. Peter tells a really wonderful story of the, the, the significance of sea otters uh, and their return. The second one is the ecological and economic importance of sea otters, featuring Aaron Galloway, who's a professor at the University of Oregon Institute for Marine Biology in, in Charleston. Uh, he's studied sea otters and kelp forests for quite a while, as well as uh, the other featured person is Dave Lacey, uh, who some of you know. Dave runs a, uh, a, uh, an outdoor sea kayak and uh, tours out of Port Orford and Gold Beach. And uh, his, uh, his business, A, it's terrific. You ought to go down there and take advantage of it. But B, uh, he's really got a good sense for why it's important to bring sea otters back to that stretch of coast. We're also working at the regional level in a couple of ways. We worked with Senator Merkley's staff a year or so ago to get some language in the, in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service budget, directing them to study the feasibility of bringing sea otters back along the entire West Coast. That report is, is in review at, at headquarters in D.C. and should be out soon, but it's helped to spark a regional conversation uh, about the need to move forward with sea otter restoration up and down the West Coast. And along that line, we've really been having a good time and really pleased to be working with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Seattle Aquarium on those two. And if things come to pass in Oregon, those are going to be two uh, key uh, allies in this whole project. Fundamentally, I think uh, we're inspired by the California condor and what it took to bring this incredible animal back from the, the verge of extinction. Uh, the length of time it took, the number of partners it took, the engagement of the tribes, the leadership of the tribes, the, the costs, you know, the funding necessary, the vision to, to maintain that. Uh, and this spring, these birds are going to be released in the mountains of Northern California. And we may, may be seeing them in, on the Southern Oregon coast and beyond sometime soon. And so the story of how uh, these birds um, nearly winked out, uh, but have come back thanks to the uh, sustained effort of so many people, that's an inspiration to us. And we take our cues from that. But along the way, we're gonna have a good time doing it. And so what's more Oregon than a otter themed beer festival benefiting the marine ecosystem? Well, we've got one for you. 
March 12th, and Chanel's been working her uh, tail off on this, we've got the Oregon Otter Beer Challenge uh, at OMSI in Portland, 6.30 to 10 p.m. Get your tickets now. Uh, we've got 13 breweries from up and uh, down the state, around the state, who have, uh, the challenge was to take a, a, a malt called Maris Otter Malt. How convenient was that? This Maris Otter Malt and to brew a, a beautiful, supple, tasteful ale or whatever they wanted to make that reflected uh, sea otters and to do so and have a good time with it. So these are the folks that have signed up with it. Many of them all have already released their ales. Uh, I've had the Pelican uh, and it's, it was really good. So these people will all, all be at uh, the event along with uh, live music, uh, some tabling, some, uh, some businesses that'll be there, some partners. So uh, go to www.alockalliance.org and uh, get your tickets, it should be fun. And so, uh, and I was gonna say, you can't do that when I worked in the public sector, but working for a nonprofit, we can do this. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, take questions. So uh, fire away. Great, thank you so much, Bob. We definitely have a lot of questions. Good, um, good, good, good. Yes, tons and tons of questions. Good. So I'm gonna try to get through as many as possible. And I'm, I'm game to be here as long as, as we need to be. All right, yeah, I might have to extend it by a, a little bit. Okay. okay, so getting started. Let's see. This person used to work at Denver Aquarium, and one of the mammal keepers told them that they had tried to reintroduce sea otters to the West Coast a while ago, but for whatever reason, all of the sea otters went either north to Washington or south to California. Is that true? And if so, why? Does it have to do, does it have anything to do with how heavily trafficked the Oregon coast is? Uh, it's sort of true. There, there is a kernel of truth in it. Uh, yes, in 1970 and 71, there were 93 sea otters that were translocated from the Aleutian Islands, from Amchatka Islands specifically, to the Oregon coast. Uh, at the same time, or in that, that same span of years, there were animals transplanted uh, from Amchitka to uh, the northern Washington coast, to Vancouver Island, and to southeast Alaska. The, the whole point was to get them out of harm's way from a, atomic testing, underground testing. The animals in, in BC, Alaska, and Washington survived. The ones in Oregon, as I showed a little earlier, that reintroduction eventually winked out. Most of the animals appear to have moved, swum north, uh, and possibly rejoined or joined up with the Washington uh, population that had the number of animals that have been introduced up there, but they left Oregon immediately, which is not un, uh, atypical. No, we don't think that they moved south. That's a long, long ways. It's only about 200 miles or 250 miles north to the Olympic coast where it's like 600 miles to swim south. So we don't think that they went that direction. But yes, there were animals brought to Oregon. Yes, the, the population failed. Uh, and we think that uh, we know why. Uh, so we're gonna try not to make those mistakes again. Gotcha. Um, thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. Um, and I guess if you could also talk about why you think that population failed. Well, a couple of reasons. What, one is that by the, as, as you saw from those graphs, and this is typical every time there's been a translocation of sea otters, is that many of them immediately and the word is emigrate, they leave town, they, 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 they wanna go back home. So we went from a population introduced uh, animals of 93 down to 23 uh, very quickly. And 23 was just simply not sustainable over time. Sea otters only have one puppy a year. Uh, if there's any kind of mortality from weather, from disease, from sharks, uh, you're gonna also be reducing the the population. So we think fundamentally there were simply not enough animals uh, introduced at, at uh, in those two in the locations near uh, Cape Arago and 
Port Orford. Gotcha. All right. Thanks for cleaning that up. Yeah, uh, um, let me also just add, uh, there were pops. Uh, the survey showed that they, in that course of that nearly 10 years, that there were about 15 pups uh, were born and counted. Uh, they seem to aggregate during summers uh, near Rogue Reef. There seemed to be a co higher concentrations near Cape Arago in the winter. So there was some acclimation to the area and pups were born, which is always a good sign. But fundamentally, there were just too few animals to survive the, the mortality that constantly surrounds uh, any population of wild animals. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then I know we very recently had an otter sighting off yeah. of the Oregon coast. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe go into how many sightings there have been in Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was so amazing. I mean, it was really, really wonderful uh, to see that little guy over there. And it was almost like losing a family member when we lost him to a shark bite. But yes, um, it's not uncommon for a single, uh, what we believe are adolescent male sea otters to detach from the Washington population, which extends as far south as nearly to uh, Gray's Harbor, for them to detach and go off looking for what all young males want to do is looking for a good time someplace and maybe some females to go with it. And so they drift down in the along with the California current grazing their way down the coast and uh, end up off the coast of Oregon. Uh, there was one showed up off Cape Arago about four years ago, stuck around for a few days off Cape Arago. Uh, there, uh, people have seen them at Depot Bay upon occasion. This one showed up at uh, near Yaquina Head, uh, just north of Newport. And one of the things that was interesting about that was it. Uh, I was talking to a man who used to be the coastal refuge manager for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Roy Lowe, who was on scene out there watching this little animal for many days. And he and I were talking about his experience that when he was with the, the refuge system in Oregon and these animals would show up, they would keep it quiet because they did not want harm to befall the animal. Well, what we saw at Newport this time at Equina Head was just the opposite and was really quite eye-opening, which was when I got out of, when I went over to see it on day four, the parking lot was jammed and people were getting out of their cars with their kids and they're bundled up and everybody's excited. They want to go see the sea otter. And it was really just so amazing to see kind of the public reception of this little guy and it made me think that you know, public visibility is probably an asset because with more eyes on this thing, the less mischief there's going to be than if it were hidden in a dark corner someplace. So it was really a, a wonderful opportunity to see a wild sea otter in the water for people to enjoy seeing it. And unfortunately, he got chomped by a, a shark, which itself is not uncommon. Uh, as adolescent sharks transition from uh, small fish uh, to larger prey, they have to learn what's good to eat and what's not. And just as there's uh, often a chomp on a surfboard, because looking up, it looks like a perhaps a seal, you got the legs sticking out and stuff. So they chomp on things to learn what's good to eat and what's not. It, Sea, uh, sea, sharks almost never actually eat uh, the uh, sea otter. They get a mouthful of fur and spit it out. But the bite is almost always fatal to a, a sea otter because it, not only can it, you know, they bleed to death and so on, but it punctures their fur and so on. And that's what happened here. Parenthetically, I will say that that has led to the question of, all right, what's the shark population off the Oregon coast? And what's the likelihood of our efforts being sabotaged by sharks uh, predating or testing out uh, sea otters as they learn what to eat. So we're working with some researchers at uh, Oregon State and Cal State uh, or University of California, Santa Cruz to actually get some funding and do some shark tagging off the Oregon coast so we can better understand the shark population. But 
that little guy uh, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it was very sad when, uh, when that happened. But yeah, it's not uncommon. Uh, there is a, a thing called the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Uh, and the coordinator is Jim Rice. He's at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. And he keeps a log of sea otter sightings, uh, whether it's verified accounts from individuals with who he knows knows what they're talking about, or people send photos. And so there is a log of those. And it's, like I say, it's not uncommon. There may be one a year, there may, we might go a couple of years before we see them, but it, it does happen. Gotcha, thank you. And yeah, that's very interesting about the shark tagging research. Yeah, can you imagine right. tagging a shark? Right. <laughs> I said, what do you do? You chum with the undergraduates or what? You drag them behind the boat? Or what? <laughs> no, they know how to do it. They figured Great. it out. All right. So we have a few questions about abalone. So I'm just going to try to yes. combine them into one question for the sake yeah. of time. Um, so what effect will reintroduction of sea otters have on the attempt to reestablish abalone on the southern coast? Uh, we'll see. Uh, Fundamentally, what it will likely do is force the abalone to hide in the cracks. That seems to be the response uh, of abalone where sea otters are found, is that abalone are still there, but they have learned to hide themselves in, in, under rocks or between rocks in, in crevices. And so, um, yeah, it's a concern as to what impact it will have on, on the abalone. But at the end of the day, uh, we think that both sea otters and uh, abalone can coexist because in the wild before, when there were sea otters present, there were abalone. Uh, the absence of sea otters from the fur trade hunting in the 1800s uh, allowed abalone to just kind of come out from under the shelters and exist out in the open in ways that they never did before and to grow to such abundance that when uh, people showed up, uh, they kind of went, whoa, look at this, all these abalone. Well, it was an artificial abundance. That's same with red sea urchins, an artificial abundance because there were no sea otters. But uh, we think when sea otters come back, they might eat them uh, here and there, but the uh, abalone will adapt. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting to know. Um, there's a, uh, let me just say there's a great book yeah. on this. Let me hold on. Let me get the, the book. In the meantime, I'm going to pop. A, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, that was quick. A, a woman in Port Orford named Ann Velisis wrote this great book. I don't know if you can see that called Abalone. Just go online and, and, and Google that Abalone. It's a great book. I mean, it's a wonderfully written. She's a great writer. She uh, loves language and plays with it, but it's a great history of, the, uh, of abalone, the relationship between abalone and people, the abalone and sea otters, particularly in California, where there's been a very fraught history uh, down there. So, but it, it has lessons for us here in Oregon as well. Gotcha. Great. Okay. So next question. Um, this person would love to have the others back on the Oregon coast, um, but ocean acidity and warming as well as areas of hypoxia continue to develop. How do scientists think these environmental problems will impact the su success of sea otter reintroduction? Um, the team that did the feasibility study doesn't think they're, those, that's a showstopper. Yes, they're of concern. Uh, actually, sea otters may help to mitigate some of the local hypoxia and acidification by uh, nurturing and promoting kelp growth. Uh, it does not seem, those do not seem to be limiting factors in California, BC or Southeast Alaska. And so we're not expecting them to be limiting factors here. Okay, good to know. Um, next question. I guess if you could just talk about climate change a little bit and how the study takes this factor into account, um, that would be great. There are a few questions about that. Yeah, it, definitely. The, the fact that as the oceans are warming and warming is 
uh, a problem for cold water species such as bull kelp, Nereocystis. And, uh, you know, they like cold water. Uh, so that's of concern with uh, change in, in ocean temperatures. Um, and that's pointed out in the, in the feasibility study. We don't think that's quite the same problem with giant kelp, which is a perennial kelp off California, as well as some areas off uh, British Columbia, although there is one patch at Cape Arago. So yeah, increasing ocean temperature and changes in uh, you know, the composition of plankton from more southern to more southern species, warm water species, is a concern. But uh, fundamentally, sea otters are pretty darn adaptable. And so as long as there are shellfish available, it, they will adapt to that. Uh, they don't actually need kelp as much as kelp needs them. Um, so we think that given what we see in California and British Columbia, that despite these increases in ocean temperature uh, and the uh, potential effect on kelp growth, we think that the sea otters will be okay and, and that they actually might even prove beneficial to kelp by giving them room to grow even as um, temperatures uh, is slowly uh, creep up in the ocean water. So, we're, uh, you know, it's of concern. I mean, it, it definitely of concern, but we see what's going on with the populations of California and uh, further north, BC, Washington, and so on. And we don't see quite the, the effects there. So we're not sure we'll see it here. In an interesting way, one of the reasons we want to do this shark research though, is that warming ocean temperatures seemed in California seemed to be moving certain life history stages of white sharks northward. And so as those life history stages move northward, that has implications for these adolescent, young adolescent sharks that are learning what to eat. And if they're learning what to eat and chomping on sea otters, that may be a bad thing. So we want to understand better the distribution and abundance of these great white sharks in relation to the, this warming ocean. And that may be one of the odd spin-off effects of a warming ocean is the presence of great white sharks in, in numbers that we had not, have not normally seen them. And we, we'd like to know that before we go down the road too much further. Gotcha, awesome. All right, I know it is past seven, but we still have quite a few people on. So I'm just gonna extend the Q&A for a little bit longer. Um, I don't think we'll be able to get through all of the questions because there are a lot and that's great, but I'll make sure to, I'll pop the Alaka Alliance's website link in that, and they have all of their great information on their website. Um, so I'd highly recommend visiting that. But the next question that I have for you is as follows. It seems like there may be a great opportunity or benefit to enhance Oregon coast estuaries through the sea otter reintroduction effort. Will estuary health be monitored um, during this reintroduction effort? Will it be monitored? I, I, I certainly, it's my intention, it's our intention to, do, to mount a re really robust monitoring. Uh, there's a great deal of interest right now in the environmental and regulatory community in the health of our estuaries, particularly eelgrass. The Pew uh, foundation at, and Nature Conservancy in particular are focused on eelgrass um, in both in California and in Oregon and, and the health of those eelgrass beds in, in our estuaries. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of opportunity to monitor those changes. For instance, South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve in Coos Bay uh, is already doing some eelgrass monitoring. I've been measuring declines in eelgrass beds for, for some time. I know there are researchers at Oregon State University doing the same thing. So we might not necessarily be the ones to do the monitoring, but one of our goals is to, is to pull together a research and monitoring plan, both for pre-translocation and post-translocation, the kinds of 
data sets we want from before and after uh, so we can take a look at the effects of sea otters. And eelgrass is definitely one of them because uh, as we've seen from eelgrass beds in Elkhorn Slough in California, sea otters are also our warriors to protect uh, eelgrass beds and by extension cleaning up uh, water quality in the estuaries and increase, increasing their, their uh, density and uh, area that they occupy. So um, we won't be actually doing that monitoring, but uh, we're going to encourage many, many others to be doing that kind of monitoring, particularly in estuaries. And that's a whole lot easier to monitor, quite frankly, than out in the ocean uh, with kelp beds, where the, the tool of the day is these high, high resolution satellite images that, um, because it's so expensive to get out and try to do in water surveys of kelp density compared to eelgrass density and abundance, uh, which is uh, much, much easier. Gotcha. So yeah, we wanna do that. Right, <laughs> awesome. All right, the next question is, um, would this reintroduction be from a specific existing population? Um, this person is just wondering about benefits to reintroducing like say a hundred sea otters from Alaska as opposed to Monterey or another location? Good question. And if you look in their feasibility study, and I think it's chapter two on population reintroductions, uh, uh, the guy that authored that section, Jim Bodkin, <clears throat> kind of went through a, a whole analysis of source populations. And then Tim Tinker with his population model actually did some modeling. What, what would be the effect if you took X number of animals out of the California population or X, Y number of animals out of the Southeast Alaska population? But beyond that, that, those kinds of science questions, the fact is that there's pushing 30,000 sea otters in Southeast Alaska, and there's right around 3,000 in California. The ones in, in Southeast Alaska are not listed as threatened or endangered. The ones in California are. So a, a, a strategy seems to be evolving, which is we would probably do the bulk of the animals initially from uh, uh, Southeast Alaska, the 200 or so, or however many we're going to capture, which is a lot of animals, uh, from Southeast Alaska because they're abundant, because they're, the regulatory framework is much easier to deal with. And uh, right now there's probably a lot of people in Southeast Alaska that would like to give them away. So uh, that's likely to be the main population source. We have been in discussions though with not just the US Fish and Wildlife Service, but with the Monterey Bay Aquarium about the potential for using uh, populations that come to uh, in Oregon, if we can establish some animals in Oregon, to then use Oregon as a location for uh, translocating some of their surrogate reared pups that come through the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And that's likely to be in an estuarine environment. Uh, right now, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has a throughput of about five animals per year. They get these orphaned or stranded pups. They, uh, they match them up with a surrogate mom. And because pups need to learn from the mom, they don't know what to do when they're born. Those surrogate mothers raise them in a very sheltered pool environment. And the Monterey Bay Aquarium folks learned by hard experience that uh, when those animals grow up, it was not a good idea to put them in the ocean. It's just simply too rough, too deep, and too foreign, and they didn't thrive. However, if they put those surrogate reared pups in Elkhorn Slough, which is a very shallow, warm, sheltered environment, they did much, much better. And when they didn't, when they were having problems, they were much easier to round up and capture and treat with, uh, for, uh, with, you know, with a veterinarian or whatever. So the idea is that we would do uh, the, the primary translocation from Southeast Alaska, and then supplement that with animals from California as they are available. And that would do two things. It would give the Monterey Bay Aquarium an additional sites to uh, rehome these animals because Elkhorn Slough is filling up. Uh, and it would also 
serve to reconnect the gene flow between the southern sea otter, a slightly smaller subspecies in California, with the northern sea otters that are here uh, in Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. Although I must say the genetics of the northerns have been really mixed up because of uh, a variety of translocations too. But nonetheless, it would, it would reconnect southern and northern genes. And looking back through the archeological record, it appears from both DNA analysis as well as morphological analysis, that Oregon was a transition zone between animals from the north and animals from the south. So that's our hope is that we can do a little of both. Gotcha, wow, that's fascinating, thank you. It's way cool. It's totally right. fascinating to think about this stuff. That's been the, really quite honestly, one of the fun things about this whole project for me is just there are so many fascinating aspects of it. Or you just get to nerd out about sea otters all you day. Nerd out, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> nerd alert, nerd alert. All right. Um, I think I'm just going to do one or two more questions just because um, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, but could you speak on the regulatory requirements for species reintroduction? Yeah, there's a whole chapter in the feasibility study. Plus, we've got a white paper from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that survived the gauntlet through all of their uh, attorney, <clears throat> attorneys taking a look at it. So we've got, fundamentally, there are two statutes, federal statutes that regulate these things. One is the environmental uh, protection, or excuse me, the Environmental Endangered Species Act. That's what I mean to say. The ESA, and the other one is the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1970. 1970. And the MMPA was adopted at a time when great whales in particular were being driven to extinction by commercial hunting. It led to all kinds of sort of like cultural uprising against that. And the manifestation of that cultural uprising um, was the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which lists all the great whales, all the pinnipeds, which is seals and sea lions, all the dolphins, all the porpoises. And interestingly enough, all the, the other mammals, um, polar bears, walruses, and sea otters are also included in that. And the whole umbrella of the Marine Mammal Protection Act is leave them alone. Uh, so uh, it's like this almost absolute protection thou shalt not harm these animals, thou shalt not take them, thou shalt not harm them, uh, leave them alone. And as a result, uh, you know, when I grew up on the Oregon coast, there was no gray whale migration to look at twice a year. There were very few seals, excuse me, big sea lions, especially the stellar sea lions. And so in that intervening 15, 60 years, thanks to the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we now have gray whales up and down the coast every year. In fact, we have some that are almost resident year round. We have an abundance of stellar sea lions, these behemoths that are actually can be kind of a problem. There's a ton of the California sea lions. There's all kinds of, you know, you go out to Solette Spit there at, at uh, the south end of Lincoln City, look across and there's, looks like all these sausages laying on the, the sand spit. Well, that's all the harbor seals. Those did not used to be there. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act has worked. And so we're gonna to need to, to be mindful of and get permission from the, the uh, Marine Mammal Commission uh, for uh, any translocation. But we'll be working through the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which under that act has jurisdiction over uh, sea otters, polar bears, and walruses. NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has um, dominion over all the pinnipeds and all the, the whales, the cetaceans. But U.S. Fish is the one we'll be dealing with, both for the Marine Mammal Protection Act and, and for the ESA. And the Environmental, um, excuse me, the Endangered Species Act will come into play, particularly if we go to, to California, where the, the, those animals are listed on the threatened and endangered species list. 
in Alaska, it's not, that's not the case. And so uh, we've got an opportunity though, under the ESA from Alaska to use section 10J uh, around experimental populations to bring them back to Oregon. On top of that, there's gonna be some other um, regulatory things. Uh, the state of Oregon's got some, oddly enough, through the Department of Agriculture, you need a permit to bring uh, live animals of, into Oregon for uh, purposes of relocating them or translocating them. Uh, US, uh, excuse me, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is not really a regulatory agency in this, but we're gonna wanna be holding hands with them because um, ultimately they're the ones that are gonna be helping or working with uh, US Fish on future uh, management of the species. So uh, without going into too much detail, we're gonna need to be mindful of the Endangered Species Act and the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act. We'll also, when we get into Oregon, have to go through the whole coastal zone consistency. Is this federal activity of bringing sea otters back, is that consistent with Oregon's coastal management program? And since I worked in that program for many years, I, I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be yes, but we're going to have to go through that process. So if you want more details, uh, look, in the, uh, look in the feasibility study. It's all there. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, it's now way past seven. So I think I'm going to have to stop questions for now. But yes, okay. please follow the link, everyone, in the chat um, to the Alaka Alliance's website. The feasibility study is on there. And there's a great website display with lots of amazing information. So um, make sure to check that out. And thank you so much, Bob, for your time. This was really fascinating and a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for hanging in there on this. This is it's, um, I think for all of us involved in the Alaka Alliance, it's a labor of love. Um, and we're committed to, to seeing this happen. And it's wonderful that people are interested and uh, are allied with us in this cause. So thank you very much. We, we really appreciate it. And uh, go sea otters. Yep. <laughs> all right. And with that, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.